Within a vast, mysterious universe, whose origins and future are incomprehensible to human minds, there spins a tiny planet that houses a variegated human family with widely ranging worldviews. Some rational, realistic, the seeing is believing folks. Others who are willing to believe without seeing. It's known as blind faith. And some of these are willing to believe really weird things. Food for Thought Productions is pleased to present a rational explanation of Why People Believe Weird Things by Dr. Michael Shermer, Executive Director of the Skeptic Society, publisher of The Skeptics Magazine, and author of Why People Believe Weird Things. Here is Dr. Shermer sharing some interesting and timely highlights from his book. There's no really good definition of a weird thing. It is, um, it is whatever somebody else believes that we don't, in, in a way, which is like what a cult is. I mean, the difference between a religion and a cult is, I'm fond of saying, is about 100 years uh, in America, if you think about it, right? I mean, uh, a cult is, the Mormons were a cult 100 years ago. Some people still think they are, I don't. But 100 years ago, they had these strange beliefs and weird customs and rituals and, and things about golden tablets and Joseph Smith in the desert, and there they are off practically starting their own country in Utah. And, and now you meet Mormons, and they're the nicest bunch of folks you'd ever want to know. Um, and, uh, you know, there's that possibly apocryphal line from L. Ron Hubbard that if you really want to make a lot of money, start your own church instead of writing science fiction. Uh, and make your science fiction the church doctrine, and that's essentially what he did. And, and it doesn't get any weirder than that if you actually sit down and read it. But in the course of 30 years, they have gained uh, international recognition as a legitimate church, legitimate meaning recognized by the U.S. government that they don't have to pay taxes, which is, you know, about as successful as you can get in America. If you can defeat the IRS, clearly you're on your way to normalcy. And so the belief system... Uh, is a powerful one. Um, I was thinking about this with conspiracy theories uh, lately. For example, if you believe that there are a group of people plotting to take over America, uh, let's say it's the UN that's going to do this, you know, there are militias that believe this, uh, then all you have to do is read the paper and you see stuff that starts to unfold into your conspiracy theory beliefs. So the way I say it is, uh, I, in, uh, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it, I flipped that. I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. So you read about a report in some newspaper about a transport of tanks through Idaho, unmarked. Aha! Aha, you see. The UN is moving their tanks in, and they're up there training in Idaho. Well, when you look into it, you find out it's a transport of a bunch of old, beat-up, useless U.S. tanks being sold to the Canadians, and they spray-painted over the markings because they're going to paint them themselves. That's all it was. And there's lots and lots of cases like that. And when you get these militia newsletters, they report these things like they're facts. Like, you know, it's everybody knows that such and such happened. Well, first of all, not everybody knows it. And second of all, uh, it actually has a completely different explanation than the one they're giving, and, uh, and so on. So when, if you believe the Jews are taking over the world, every time you read about, you know, some Goldstein got hired by a bank, aha, you see, see those Jews are taking over the banks, and so on. And so it's the power of the belief system to just twist the way you look at the world into and make it mold and fit the way the belief system works. It's a non-falsifiable uh, proposition, these conspiracies. There's no way to prove or disprove it. I can't prove that there uh, is not a Santa Claus, though I'm you know, pretty sure that there's not. Uh, so you can't prove a negative. That's one of the frustrating things of dealing with conspiracy theories is there, it's a, it's a self-enclosed system. No matter what explanation anybody gives, the person has a comeback to counter that. And, and, and that's when belief systems get a little scary because uh, then there's no room for it to change or evolve or if you have a dangerous belief system to get out of it if you're so convinced that nothing can disprove it. Anyway, I'm relatively sympathetic to some of these belief systems since I was a believer in a lot of the stuff myself, which is how I got interested in the subject. I mean, who would not be interested in a lot of the themes of X-Files, for example? I'm convinced this is the, why the show is so popular. Um, all these different themes that they bring up are fascinating to all of us. And at uh, any rate, so when you look into alien abductions, for example, um, I've had an alien abduction story. I mean, I've had an alien abduction experience myself. Do you, you, you want to hear this? Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I rarely hear no. <laughs> 
Okay, there you go. <laughs> well, while I'm telling this story, you can go back to the book table and get your copy. Anyway, it's 1983. I was uh, traveling along a rural highway in Nebraska. This is where they always happen, by the way. You ever notice that, that the crop circles and the abductions always happen, you know, in Farmer Bob's Field and Pucker Brush, Kansas? You know, they never happen in Dodger Stadium. They don't happen at the White House, except in movies. Um, anyway, but that's true. Mine did hap actually happen on this little rural highway. Uh, right outside of a town called Hagler, Nebraska, 1983. It was August 8th, I think it was. And I was going along on a, uh, on a bicycle. I was riding a bike, and a, a large uh, spacecraft came up over my left shoulder, bright lights and stopped me from uh, proceeding further down the road. The aliens got out of the craft, and they abducted me into the spacecraft. Uh, and abducted is the right word. I didn't want to go. I resisted them. And uh, I lost 90 minutes of time. Uh, and abductees even have a term for this called lost time or missing time. There's a whole genre of literature about this stuff, missing time. There's a book called Missing Time. And uh, the theory is, is they erase your memory. Uh, of what happened in there. And sure enough, I, I have no memory of what happened in that 90 minutes. The next thing I knew, I was back outside the spacecraft, and I got back on my bike, and I continued down the road. Now, if that's all I told you, that would sound like a typical alien abduction experience, except there's a few little twists. First, first of all, the aliens, my aliens didn't look like the little gray men with the big eyes and the long, slender arms and fingers and toes. Uh, mine looked like you guys, real human beings. Um, in fact, they looked like people I knew, except they had stiff little fingers. And that's how I knew that they were aliens, because they had stiff little fingers. Now, now, there's a clue for you. Some of you may remember a television show in the 1960s starring Roy Thinnes, where aliens were uh, invading the Earth and taking over humans, but they didn't want the rest of the humans to know about it, so they looked just like humans, except for some peculiar reason. They couldn't bend their little finger, so they had to wear gloves and stuff like this. Anyway, so there's a clue for you that uh, maybe this wasn't going on uh, out there. Maybe it was going on in here because this was one of my favorite shows. And then if I fill in the rest of the story, you say, oh, okay. This was 1983. It was in the middle of the transcontinental bicycle race across America that I'm the, one of the founders of and raced in five times. And there's no uh, sleep rules about this bike race. Every rider is self-contained with a motorhome with big bright lights and a support crew, eight to 10 people that take care of each rider, a van and so on, uh, following you along. And I had gone 83 hours without sleep. But we started in the Santa Monica Pier, and I had ridden all the way to Nebraska, all the way through the Colorado Rockies and into Nebraska without stopping. Of course, a couple potty breaks, but no sleep breaks. And uh, it's about 1,280 miles uh, continuously on a bike. So I was physically exhausted, obviously. Uh, sleep deprived, obviously, 83 straight hours, hallucinating like crazy, weaving down the road at about three miles an hour. So the motorhome came up on my left side and said, stop, you're dangerous, you're going to bed. So the support crew got me out and put me to bed. I went down for 90 minutes of sleep, got back up, relatively refreshed, as refreshed as you can be of 90 minutes of sleep after 83 straight hours, and continued down the road back at my normal high speed of travel at 15 miles an hour. <laughs> and uh, so it goes in the race. But uh, I remember distinctly having these discussions with the crew, because knowing that they were aliens trying to abduct me, I didn't want them to know that I knew that they were aliens, so I was quizzing them. <laughs> So, for example, my mechanic, I asked him what kind of glue he used to glue on my sew-up tires. Uh, uh, bike, uh, racing bikes use uh, uh, tires that are self-contained with the tube sewn up inside the tire itself, and they're glued onto the rim. And, uh, and I had this special imported Tubasti glue from Italy, and, and it was this red color thing. And, and he had said that it was glued on with Tubasti, and I was really impressed that they knew this. The aliens actually knew the name of this imported Italian bike racing glue for tires. Talk about a specialty item. Anyway, they, so instead of thinking, hey, maybe I'm hallucinating here, and clearly these are my crew members and they're not aliens, I could not get out of my belief system that these were aliens and I was being abducted. Uh, so, and I, I used to tell that story actually when I, I taught psychology for many years in the 80s, and that was my favorite example of, of a schizophrenic who hears voices. I mean, they really hear the voices, and they're quite real to them. And to me, the talking to the aliens were quite real. My point is that if it can happen to me under conditions X, Y, and Z, surely it could happen to somebody else under conditions A, B, and C, right? And um, so, and, and by the way, I, uh, I did a, a two-hour NBC special on alien abductions once, 
uh, in which I was the token skeptic. You know how that goes. Twelve believers, one skeptic, five minutes left in the show. Okay, Dr. Shermer, here's your mic. Give us an explanation. And by the way, the other guests will be rudely interrupting you while you try to explain. Okay, go. <laughs> any rate, uh, or they cry and weep, and you know the producers all know uh, that this is going to happen because they have little boxes of Kleenex behind the couches and chairs in the studio and stuff. I mean, it's drama. It's television. That's all it is. Television is simply, I've decided after years of doing television stuff, Television is simply a bunch of commercials with blank spaces in between that have to be filled to keep the people watching to the next commercial. That's all it is. And uh, it's a game you have to play, and that's why if you want to play, you have to get your own skeptic show, and we're working on that. In any case, so being a friendly skeptic that I am, they invited me out to dinner after the show, the abductees, that is. There was like 12 of them. I thought this is a great opportunity to actually talk to some real abductees and see what they're like. Because when I do an investigation, you know, I, uh, I don't like to do it from a distance uh, with secondary literature. I want to go meet the person. I want to look him in the eye. I want to shake his hand. I want to have dinner with him. I want to find out, you know, who he's married to and does he have kids? What were his parents like? Where did he grow up? You know, I want to know about the person. And that's the only way you can get inside somebody's head. So I went out to dinner with him and, and these were the nicest folks. They were rational, intelligent, uh, reasonable people. They had like regular real jobs. And, uh, but the, the common experience was they'd all had this weird experience. And, 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 and it was like this, two different kinds of experience that they had. About half of them recalled being abducted by aliens hmm, like five to ten years after it happened. And they didn't exactly remember. The memory was recovered in a therapy session using a hypnotic regression back into an earlier age in their life to try to get to the core of some problem they were having. Like in the case of one guy, he said he went to a therapist for you know depression. He was depressed. So he went to a psychotherapist who also happened to believe that aliens are abducting humans. And so you see how the memory is not, it's, memory is not like a videotape that you, you, know, you play back, you rewind and play it back and you watch it and go, oh wow, look, I didn't know that happened to me. That's not how it works. Memory is constantly being edited and and re-edited and, and deleted and added to and, and, and so on. Even the process of thinking about your memories changes the memory. So, I mean, do you really remember your 10th birthday? Or do you remember seeing the, the pictures of your 10th birthday when you were 20 and then your parents telling you about what you did on your 10th birthday uh, uh, added to by the fact when you're 15 you also went through this process and re-remembered the 10th birthday. And, and so your 10th birthday gets changed and, and constantly, you know, edited along the way. So we don't really have exact memories. And, and so as soon as you begin to, to see common elements like, I actually didn't remember it after it happened. It was many, many, many years later. Uh, that's one set of them. So that was, a, that was a, an alarm in my head that went off when a number of these. The other half uh, did remember him right away. So I said, OK, when, when did it happen? Oh, it, it happened at night when I was asleep. OK, there's another alarm that should go off in your mind. A, a small percentage of the population has lucid dreams and hallucinations at night, hypnopompic hallucinations that happen just before you wake up, hypnagogic hallucinations that happen just after you fall asleep, where you are dreaming and in your dream you wake up. You see, follow me, you, you're actually asleep but you think you're awake. And in your dream, you think you're awake and you can't move. You feel paralyzed, almost like a, we've all had the dream of running away from something and you just can't go and you're going slower and it's going to get you and slower. The bees are chasing you or whatever it is. Uh, and you just can't move your legs. You feel paralyzed. Uh, well, these people actually have the same kind of experience, except it's a little more dramatic. And typically what they see is somebody who has died, a loved one that has died. And, and you know, there's mom in the room and she's at the foot of the bed and she's in the the dress we buried her in, I see her clearly in the dress we buried her in. And I was awake. I mean, I wasn't asleep, I was awake, but I couldn't move, I was paralyzed. I wanted to get up and hug her, you know. If you videotape them in a sleep lab, you know, you, the videotape is the evidence. They're not getting up, they're sound, they're out. You know, they're a log in the bed there. But, so it's happening up here, clearly. But in the last 20 years or so, we've seen this in surge of reports. They're not seeing mom at the foot of the bed. They're seeing, and they're not seeing ghosts at the foot of the bed, which we also used to get. Now they're seeing aliens at the foot of the bed. Why aliens? Well, 500 years ago, people had these sorts of experiences you can read about, uh, where succubi and incubi oozed through the walls into the bedrooms and molested and harassed people in their beds. These were demons, uh, Satan's helpers in there uh, molesting you. and. 
you know, the woman is impregnated by Satan. And she's carrying Satan's child. She's a witch. Burn her. You know, so what was popular four or five hundred years ago, of course, was demonology and the dominance of the church and the paradigm or worldview was this good spirits, evil spirits, and, and so on. So we should not be surprised that those are the kinds of dreams they had. A hundred years ago, people had these experiences. It was ghosts oozing through the walls. Houses were haunted. Spirits were infiltrating houses and people's bedrooms at night, harassing, molesting, and, uh, and, and so on. In our culture, what's popular? Not demonology, not ghosts and haunted houses. It's mainly aliens. Uh, Star Trek and Star Wars and X-Files and alien autopsies and communion and fire in the sky and all these films and movies and TV documentaries and Life and Time magazine uh, articles and uh, tabloids and talk shows and you know it's everywhere it's in our culture and so if you think about my experience again I hadn't thought about this show The Invaders starring Roy Thinnes in you know 15 20 years it was somewhere in the memory there uh, when I was eight or something is when the show was on and, and I hadn't thought about it in, in all that time and somehow it came up uh, under this weird set of circumstances of sleep deprivation so if that could happen to me a relatively skeptical fellow uh, surely this could happen to anybody dredging up images of uh, things they've seen in their culture and that's what's popular in our culture so we should not be surprised that people have common reports of what the aliens look like. Now John Mack, and he's the psychiatrist at Harvard that wrote the book Abduction, uh, and the other believers, they say uh, part of the corroborative evidence for them is that different people who don't know each other give the same reports of what the aliens look like. But we've all seen the same shows. We've all seen Whitley Stryber's book cover. It's in every bookstore. He sold millions of copies of the, the big head with the oval eyes and so on. We've all seen the image. It's burned into our memory somewhere. The Invaders, Roy Thinnes. If it can happen to me, it can happen to anybody. And um, so that's what I think is going on. It's either one of these recovered memory type movement uh, therapy sessions, or it's this hypnopopic type hallucination, or a combination of both. That covers about 90% of the cases I've heard of. The other 10%, and I don't know if people are making it up, maybe some people hoax it, who knows, uh, I mean, but inevitably somebody says, yeah, but that's not my case. It happened during the day, I'm driving down the, you know, 405 freeway at 2 in the afternoon, and I was abducted, you know. Okay, I don't, what happened to your car? I mean, what, you know, who was driving when you were, you know, you know, they, so I, you know, I never know about those. So I, those are the 10% the anomalies I can't explain. And by the way, on UFO reports too, the true believers, in, I mean, the really serious UFO people, uh, they will admit that 90% of all the sightings ever reported are easily explained with weather balloons, rockets, Venus, and so on. We're really only talking about a small handful of anomalies that need to be explained. And in my view, they don't need to be explained. In any field of science, there's lots of unexplained anomalies that just kind of get put off to the wayside, or somebody over here is working on it, and somebody's working on this one, and maybe it gets explained, maybe it doesn't. Anyway, then I move from that to the recovered memory movement, which looks exactly like the alien abduction stuff. When you find out and you talk to women who have reported being sexually molested as young children, not the real ones where they actually have physical doctor reports and sibling uh, eyewitness reports and the mother turned them in and the guy's in jail. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this other subset of molestation reports where nobody knows about it except this woman who 40 years later uh, remembered that this happened to her but when you look into it you find out she didn't remember. She recovered a memory after months and months in a very special kind of a therapy session where the therapist is a firm believer that one-third to one-half of all women were sexually molested as young children by their fathers or uncles or grandfathers or whoever the perpetrator is, which means if you just think about it for a second, let's say just take half of all women, so every, every other one of you women in here was sexually molested, and that means half of you men in here were molesters because somebody has to be the molester. Uh, every other American in America, 130 million of us, uh, are sexual molesters. Okay, there's something wrong right off the top here. That This is clearly a moral panic. There's some runaway effect here going on. It can't be that bad, even though it actually does occur on some level. Uh, so when we look into how these memories are reconstructed, you see it doesn't happen overnight. The woman doesn't walk into a therapy session. Therapy ses ther therapist says, you were molested, and she says, oh golly, you're right, and that's the end of that. Usually what happens is it takes, you know, two or three months, sometimes up to six months. 
where the person says, look, I, they go to therapy for some reason, depression, anxiety, tech eating disorders, marital problems, whatever it may be, um, any, any one of number of life's problems that all of us have. Um, and the therapist says, you know, the set of symptoms you have is very reminiscent of the set of characteristics I have witnessed in other clients of mine who turned out to be molested when they were children. Do, do, do you think you might have been? No, I, I'm sure I wasn't. You know, I have a fine relationship with my parents. You know. Well, okay, I mean, maybe you weren't anyway. Well, listen, why don't you take this book and read it? It's called The Courage to Heal, and it's all about this, you know, because many of my clients, just like you, they couldn't remember either, but many, many months later, they did remember, and boy, they've really solved a lot of their problems with that. Really? Yeah. So take this book and read it. And by the way, tomorrow on Oprah, there's a good show on this with some other women who, just like you, they couldn't remember. And many months later, they did. And so on. So you see what I'm constructing here is a information feedback loop in, in which the belief system uh, then is fed with information from the culture, from the therapist, from talk shows, from books, from magazine articles, and so on. So this thing hit a pinnacle in about 1991, 92, uh, it, as, as defined by tracking the number of reported cases of, of, uh, of parents who were accused. There is now a false memory syndrome foundation to combat the recovered memory syndrome movement. And they have been keeping data on parents reporting being falsely accused. Um, the creationist movement is nothing more than a political movement. It's the attempt to get, um, despite their protestations to the contrary, it's an attempt to get biblical literalism taught in public schools and nothing more. All you have to do is read their literature. They're deeply religious people who firmly believe in a young earth and a literal translation of the Bible, period. That's what they believe. They believe that America has gone to hell in a handbasket because of evolution, which leads to atheism, which leads to sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and abortion, and crime, and so on and so on. They have the whole laundry list, communism, and so on, a whole laundry list. I, I, I um, actually reprint uh, in my book uh, this uh, tree here on page uh, 134, the, 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 the tree of evolution. These are all the bad things that, that lead from evolution. Abortion, humanism, alcohol, cult, sex education, communism, homosexuality, suicide, genetic engineering, racism. Um, oh, oh, women's and, and children's liberation. Oh, that's a bad one. Heaven forbid women and children become liberated. Uh, dirty books, moral education, terrorism, socialism, hard rock, inflation, secularism, crime. As if none of these things existed before 1859. In 1859, we had the birth of crime. Before that, things were just fine. <laughs> wow, it's an incredible worldview they hold, but that's what they believe. As usual, after a stimulating speech, there were questions. Someone asked about the little boxes on job applications. What about the Tiger Woods syndrome? Well, um, that's probably the most controversial chapter in the book. I didn't get into it here because it's, it's a big subject. That is the race and IQ chapter. Basically, I said that I think the concept of race is antiquated. Uh, almost impossible to define with any sort of scientific consistency. What do you mean by a race? And what about all the fuzzy blending? I mean, fu races are at best fuzzy sets and they're becoming ever more fuzzy. And uh, so it's, it's much my preference to deal with individuals as individuals rather than the groups anyway. Uh, I, to be consistent, you, uh, to take that position, by the way, you also have to be against affirmative action and quota hiring because if you're against pigeonholing people into groups, then there's no possible way to group them for affirmative action purposes. Uh, I find it uh, ironic that liberals who are against the concept of race like I am on a, for scientific reasons, at least what I think are scientific reasons, are also in favor of affirmative action. Well, if you're against race, how are you going to allocate the funds? How are you going to, you have to check the box somewhere. I'm in favor of getting rid of all the boxes. Question, how do believers know which version to believe? Um, I think in the long-term scheme of things, if you look at like the last 500 years, uh, you had a single dominant church 500 years ago. Now you have literally thousands of churches. Even just since the 60s, there's been a glut of New Age religions and uh, you know, self-help groups and pyramid schemes and cults and so on. All that's part of this, um, I think, uh, individuality movement away from large, huge collectives uh, like the church uh, toward more individual, personally tailored religions and belief systems. And uh, I, I, don't know what, I don't know why that would, would taper off. I mean, I guess 
if it got to the point where every single person had their own religion, that would be the, couldn't get any more than that. But uh, yeah, unless, you know, <laughs> so many idiots, so few comets, right? Uh, you know. I guess you've seen this bumper sticker, have you already? <laughs> I didn't make that up. It was somebody else's bumper sticker. Uh, so I think it's, you know, um, in recent times, it's probably stemming from the 60s. Uh, you know, in the, in the early 70s, when all the Jesus cults really took off, uh, Steve Allen wrote a fascinating book on this, Beloved Son, it's called, how his son uh, joined one of these Jesus cults. Oh, it's just a really uh, uh, moving, emotional book. You know, Steve Allen, the entertainer, I mean, he, uh, his son sent him this letter. His son was 20, 21 at the time. Nothing he could do about it. His son just sent him this letter saying, Dear Dad, you know, love you and Mom, but uh, I'm out of here. You'll never hear from me again. I found love. I found Jesus. You know, I found the ultimate wonderful group. It's in Seattle. And, uh, and goodbye and good luck. Uh, you know, I'll see you in the next life. You know, I mean, basically, I'm paraphrasing. And, you know, poor Steve, you know, like any father, what? <laughs> I've just lost my son, right? So, but, but unlike other fathers, good old Steve Allen, he went and read every book there was to read on cults and religion and groups, went up there, drove up there, joined the group, you know, became part of them to figure out what was going on, you know, investigated cults and wrote a book about it, you know, and it's great. I recommend that book, Beloved Son by Steve Allen. Comment. People seem especially susceptible lately. See, first of all, it's 2000. It could be 2001. The Bible Code found 2006, 2009. Hal Lindsey has like 2007, 2015, 2044. They're, they're getting smart now. They're not giving single predictions. They're saying, well, it could happen here, it could happen there, and they'll give multiple dates, you know, because it keeps people hanging on. A reasonable question. Our next issue, by the way, is on the subject of God, atheism, theism, agnosticism, the differences, and so on. In reality, of course, there's really only two positions. You're either a theist, you have a belief in a God, or you're an atheist, you have no belief in a God. You're a skeptic of all things weird. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary lists three possible meanings. Magical, unearthly or mysterious, unusual or fantastic. The Random House Unabridged Dictionary goes into more detail, including involving the supernatural, unearthly, anything outside natural law, beyond human comprehension, or bizarre examples in regard to unusual apparel, as in a weird getup. Skeptics like Dr. Shermer are inveterate debunkers of weird beliefs. Skeptics and rationalists challenge anything that cannot be verified. What's so attractive about the weird? Well, it's fun for one thing. It's easy to let the imagination run wild. It's more for entertainment than introspection. A safe shock value and antidote for boredom. Food for Thought Productions was pleased to present Dr. Michael Shermer. Not only to shed the light of reason on some common weird beliefs, but also to provide ammunition for everyone who encounters such nonsense. We hope you have found this program intellectually stimulating and that you will continue to investigate the ideas raised here. To connect with other like-minded individuals, please contact any of the dozens of free thought organizations, such as the American Humanist Association, American Atheists, the Center for Inquiry, and Atheists United. You may also email the producer directly by leebaker27 at gmail.com. This program has been distributed through the courtesy of Atheist United.